So week one, um, we talked about just the idea of being offended and um, that that it, we were going to encompass wounded in any way, not not um, that we weren't going to put a uh, a boundary on what wounds offend us, like great, big, huge, life altering wounds versus um, almost like little irritations, because it all feeds into the same pot of uh, a heart that begins to gradually close off. So that that was kind of week one. What does it mean to be offended? Um, week two was a focus on recognizing uh, our own um, what offends us and acknowledging how inundated we are in um, the world in which we live now and for some people the lifestyles that they live um, if if you are on a lot of social media I am I'm not but um, I, I'm gonna it's out there that's for sure and then um, we, in week three, um, we began to look at why, why that's not a good thing. Um, and when we open the door to being offended by little things, it is the door of our spiritual heart and um, it can be contagious. And last week, um, we talked about truth and how important um, that we have that our truth is a spiritual truth and not a truth that we, uh, not worldly truth, and that we are uh, more discerning in our truth, um, that we take more responsibility and um, really knowing that what we are believing is something that is in line with what Christ would have us believe. Uh, we watched the Helen video, um, which I have to say lifted the bar of um, creating a truth to a level that I was not prepared for before I um, started doing this class or getting ready to do this class. Um, a couple of you weren't here. Bob, did you watch the Helen video or no? I had Okay. I have it. It's on my... I just started this evening. Okay. Um, anybody want to summarize what was so earth-shattering in the he Helen video? I will. Okay. So what was earth shattering is all that she went through, um, you know, being a missionary. And then um, when they had the upheaval and um, all that she went through with um, being tortured and raped and, and um, how she still um, pretty much said God, um, I'm willing to do whatever you want. Uh, I'm, I don't understand what's going on here, but I'm willing to mm -hmm. um, praise you, even though this is going on in my life. Um, and then, and then, um, you know, after she had went through this all, uh, you know, just telling other people about that, that um, God was with her through the whole um, thing. And then she could um, be a witness to other people who had gone through it. And then um, at the end, kind of understood why God had allowed this to happen in her life. But something so horrific that she um, was just willing to say, God, it's in your hands. If this is what you want me to go through, I'm willing to do it and praise you and thank you mm -hmm. that I was able to do this for you and for witnessing for you. And how many of us could say that? I mean, how many of us can say we go through anything? You know, um, I can't say, you know, my knee blew up a few years ago and I was off for three months and I can't say, oh, yes, God, I'm so happy that happened. So I can tell somebody someday 
oh, I know what you're going through. My <laughs> knees, you know, I mean, I never thought about it that way that, um, you know, that all the things that happened in our life that um, we're supposed to have joy even during those times. Um, that's kind of, it kind of blows the way he was, that we think. Because mm -hmm. you know? it's, it's not of this world. No, it's not natural to think that it way. Is, it is such spiritual maturity. Um, I have to think that there are a few people that get to the level of spiritual trust and spiritual maturity that Helen got to. Um, because, right, in the, in the midst of throngs of being brutally beaten and mm -hmm. raped, um, she heard God asking, can you trust me? And let me use your body in this way. And um, she did say that, like, in the throng, she said yes, but she didn't really understand what she was saying yes to. She had to step outside of it and process it um, and look back upon it. But, uh, and for me, the contrast of the truth that she created in that moment, that, that this is what God needed of her to do. And she was grateful. And not only she was thanking him for this experience. And then the story the two weeks ago of Frank, who created the truth in his life that um, he couldn't be anything in life because he had a school teacher who told him he wasn't smart and how he carried that truth. Um, so the the danger, which leads us into tonight's lesson, the danger of living with an unoffendable heart and a heart that is offended, um, not even based on truth, it, it there's a big cost to it. And much more than I realized, um, well, that I ever realized. And um, God doesn't really discriminate that much in sin. I think we think there's the big ones. Um, and if we do little sins, it's not such a big deal. Uh, but as we're, we're going to listen to um, a preacher tonight, um, address that issue that in, in, and I have some Bible verses for you to consider too, that um, of the deadly sins, most of them are not, um, the or not deadly sins, but sins of the flesh. Most of them aren't that, that big. They seem like little, little things that, that wouldn't rail God up too much. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at in Proverbs, the things that God thinks is an abomination, most of them are tied around this idea of being offended. So um, the bullet points tonight are living in discord with the spirit. So if you are living, if your heart is occupied with being offended, angry, irritated, annoyed, or bigly wounded, a wound that you're carrying around just year after year after year because you've been so offended that you just can't be any other way because what was done to you was so awful, you have to carry that offense. Um, if you are living in discord with the spirit, and uh, we're going to talk about that, and then um, really the idea of being disinherited from the kingdom. That's pretty scary, uh, and this isn't my. This isn't me saying it to you. It's it's. There's biblical things that say it. Um, it's been the the lesson that has come out, and all of the people that I have studied who have already done unoffendable uh, courses or written about it is it's a bigger thing than we think it is and it could cost us our place in the kingdom so i think that is um pretty important and then just negative impacts that we don't understand um mm -hmm. that i would never have an understanding of that's where we're going to finally hear the maggie story yay uh i hope it's as good as i think it is because <laughs> i really told you it was good um 
And then just what it does to our bodies, our emotions, and how we spew that on to other people. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I have to give shout outs to Drew. He is the creator of the graphics that um, have gone along with this series. I told him what I wanted. And when I looked at the ones that he did for this class, I thought, oh my gosh, those are those are pretty graphic graphics, but it's ugly business. Um, so let's let's dig in. Living in discord with the spirit. Being offended seems natural. It seems like it's our right and um, relatively harmless in terms of sin, but it does have greater consequences than we recognize. You cannot, from Corinthians, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of the demons. So short term, like if you, you know, you short, short term, you, you do something that is sinful um, and then you ask for forgiveness. We're not talking about that. I think our God is very loving and very forgiving. But if this is the way that you live, this is your pattern of behavior, you are going to have way more of Satan in you than you are um, God time. There's going to be a lot of Satan time in your heart. And uh, at, at what time does that cost you your entrance to the kingdom? Uh, from Galatians, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. So you have freedom of choice, but be careful what you choose to do. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Any thoughts on that? <clears throat> what I would um, then just caution, many of the enemies, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call them, strategies are subtle um, and require us then to have self-discipline and awareness of our spiritual choice and values. And that really goes as... Bob was saying before class started, if, if you read the James um, Bible study this morning, it's really tied into that. Uh, we, ha we have to be responsible for developing the spiritual maturity to not get involved in worldly things um, and in and, and the worldly things that are so easy to get involved in is just being irritated and ticked off and angry and um, then sowing discord because of that. Uh, tied closely to that then goes on into, into um, Galatians. The answer of the flesh are, of course, sexual morality. That sounds like a big thing. Um, impurity, debauchery idolatry, witchcraft, but hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfless ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, those all don't seem like they're that big a deal. But they're all the things that are tied into our, as we process um, hurt, things that irritate us, things that, that we think are done to us that are wrong. And that, those are Satan-y things that live in our hearts. Do you mean done to us or we do to others? Both. Okay. We have to, yes. We perceive they're done to us. Yes, but we, yes, we, are, we tend to be programmed, I think, to perceive that we are, we are often way more wronged than any wrong that we do to others. <clears throat> And in um, this isn't a complete, this isn't Proverbs 16 through 19, but it's kind of a, a list of the things that God thinks are abominations. Um, 
that word is not tied to God thinking murder is an abomination. Um, it, it's just not used in context with some of the things that we think are bigger sins. It's tied into these little things because, because they're the things that drive dissension and drive people apart. Um, haughty eyes. Now, who would ever really think that if you're looking at somebody and you're rolling your eyes, that that is a big thing? But um, it's communicating a lot. Judgment, um, think, thinking, disrespect. disrespect, and thinking you're a little superior to whatever it was that you just witnessed or what somebody said or or, or some haughty mean haughty. Um, Sorry. Yeah, thinking putting on an air that you are superior to somebody else. Um, I come from the call it looking down your nose at people. Yeah. Get it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any of that. A lying tongue. Um, and well, hands that shed innocent blood. Yes, that's kind of a big thing. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Now, when you're offended and when you've been offended or when I have been offended in my life I talk to myself about that happening and um I'm not always thinking real nice things about whoever it was that did whatever they did to me um and I don't know that I ever planned anything horribly wicked but um, I wouldn't have felt real bad if something horribly wicked might have happened to somebody who had grossly offended me at a different time in my life. I mean, I, I'm hoping I'm getting more spiritually mature, but um, there's sometimes I just need a time out um, to get myself self-corrected back to thinking, okay, grow up enough of that. Um, so where do you go at that point? When I take my little time out, yeah, um, I go to prayer. Okay. I ask Jesus to come here and talk to me. Slap me up the side. Yeah, head. come on. And, and what what does he say to you through the word? What does he say? Um, sometimes he's funny. Um, either that, or I'm in a mood where I'm thinking that's what he's saying to me, and I think it's funny. Uh, um. Sometimes um, I, there isn't one thing. It depends on the situation. Um, but I have learned discernment and I hear his message. Is, and most of it is get over it. It's not important. But if, do you have a scripture verse that you can lean on? Um, I, uh, there's many. I mean, I've got I've got many marked. Um, I I do well. I'm I'm an electronic keeper, so I will go reading into all my favorite passages that I've clipped and and put. Um, I don't know that I have one because it depends on the situation. Um, you know, there's times where I love what Hebrews has to say, or um, I'm usually looking in the New Testament. I but there are some Psalms I go to and. I like what you said, though, about a sense of humor, because I have felt that um, I think some people don't think God has a sense of humor, and oh, I think he yeah. has a wonderful sense of humor. And sometimes I like, like you said, I just know that he's like, oh, okay, God, that was for you. Okay, get off your high horse, Terry. And 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 I, I do think that he talks to us, like you said, through humor a lot, where um, he'll just, you know, whatever we're complaining about, he'll show us that in us but in a funny way mm -hmm. and so you go okay i get it god you're saying i'm exactly like that too mm -hmm. but in a humorous way so i yeah i get that too i don't know how long ago but i for me it's i hear breathe and it happened a long time ago breathe through it that's mm -hmm. what i heard so now when i feel <laughs> overwhelmed or anything it's breathe before I do anything else, just sit and be and breathe. Um, 
Mm -hmm. That works. And depending on what it is, it's be still and know the Lord. That's mm -hmm. that's what I that's one one that mm -hmm. I go to, depending on how serious what I feel is going on. Um yeah. Okay, there's more in here besides the heart and the wicked schemes. Feet that are swift to run into mischief. Um, I don't think this is little kids being naughty. I think this is as adults where when um, when somebody's done something to you, and again, it's how are we programmed. Um, I have a relative in my family who loves to tell everybody immediately, every time something that she perceives is... Um, has wronged her. And it, I mean, she's like got a phone tree going. Um, I think those are feet that are causing mischief. Um, it, it, and certainly when you start to, to um, stir up discord, where you try to to get other people into your camp of whatever it, whatever it is. When uh, Mark and I first moved to Wassa, we belonged to a different church, and um, there was there was very obvious discord in that church where there were two groups, and I don't I don't even know what the issue was because that I didn't get involved in it. Um, I had people on both sides, so that that was kind of funny. That church was set up where there was a fellowship hall on one side and then there was a what they called the parlor a nice living roomy like thing uh with that had doors um into the kitchen into fellowship hall and then this other room and so one in the treats were always in the um in the nice room so both parties would like go to the table and get their treats and then they would retreat to this side of the parlor or into the fellowship hall and and just every Sunday stir up um discord over something. I don't know what it was. Well anyway, Mark and I had had it and we came here and on Tuesday Sid was in our living room and probably about two weeks later we were members of, of Cullen. But um so the point is that what we might perceive to be something small isn't necessarily something small and and how often we live that way did i copy the same thing twice i guess i really like that <laughs> there it is again many of the enemy strategies are subtle and require us to have self-discipline and awareness of our spiritual choices and values apparently i really like them so um the the negative impact beyond our understanding that a little goofed up and not tormenting. Um, those Bible verses I, I chose because I thought they continued to speak to this issue. Um, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why? as though you still belong to the world do you submit to the rules. It's really hard. You know, we live here, um, but why are we not more tied to our, our spiritual home, our spiritual rules? Why do we get so bogged down? So here's the Maggie story. Um, Okay, hey, Maggie's at home, but she's in here, so I'll tell the story. This was a story from um, why people don't heal and what they can do about it. A book that I was reading when I was in recovery from my head injury, and I really chose it. Well, somebody told me to read it, but somebody I respect and somebody who really wanted me to, to heal. And... Um, I chose it because I thought it was going to heal me physically. It was going to help me find the the peace that I wasn't finding in in Western medicine and all the things that I was trying to do to to recover. Um, 
but it it was way more of spiritual healing um that then in turn i think gave way to a physical healing but not it wasn't the it wasn't the way that i thought it was going to happen um so Maggie, the the lady Carolyn Meese, who um, wrote this book, is um, a term that I hadn't become familiar with until um, whatever how many years ago was I, that I had a hidden dream. I'm gonna say eight years ago. Um, a Christian mystic. Um, I thought maybe that was like not a good thing like it was more false mm -hmm. prophet witchcraft crafty kind of thing but um i don't know what all christian mystics are but um she is someone who helps people heal and was given that gift um and she is a christian um she's very familiar with all the um many religions uh, but she I, she very blatantly in her book or very openly in her book says that she's a christian um but she goes around and gives talks on healing and how you have to heal mind body and spirit if, if you're if you've got something that's going on in your body it's been going on for a long time it's not just a physical thing. There's more going on and, and she tries to help people unlock that. So um, so Maggie came up to her, the lady's name isn't Maggie, um, came up to her after or during a break or whatever. And she said, I would like to share a story with you. She said, um, I was in a major car accident in which I died. And while I was in death or near death, I left my body. And it was uh, in a lot of traffic. It was a, a busy highway where the accident happened. And that resulted in people having to stop in traffic and be what I call a bottleneck. Nobody was moving in either direction. And as she was in this kind of ethereal state, she was moving over the cars. She could see the cars. And from some of the cars, there was darkness. Um, and she could hear talk that she could discern it, but she could hear angry voices. And then she saw a, like a white smoke just drifting up from one of the cars. And she thought to herself, I need to go see what that is. And the woman in that car was praying for the for Maggie. She didn't know who she was praying for, but she was praying for who was ever involved in the accident. And um, as she could see this the ethereal whiteness, it came and went right into her and she went back in, into her body. Now, I'm not going to debate with you whether that really happened or not. This is her story. And um, she was cognizant of the license plate of the car that of the lady who was praying for her. And so when she got better, she somehow found out who that lady was and went to that woman's house and um, told the story and said, I, I just want you to know how powerful what you chose to do at that moment um, was because I heard your prayer, I felt your prayer, and it was different than the majority of what was going on around me. So when I read the Maggie story, I thought, oh my gosh, that is, um, it's amazing on so many counts, but it made me think about my thoughts because I can have really negative thoughts in, in my head and nobody around me knows it. 
Um, I don't, I'm not really hurting anybody. I may be hurting myself again, having that up in me instead of, you know, good, pure spiritual stuff in me. But if that has a visible plume to God and God can see black smoke coming out of our heads, so to speak, or beautiful white prayers and beautiful white praise and beautiful white love. I want to be much more in that camp than I want to be in the moments where I have um, dark things coming out of me. Well, I was just reading that in Nehemiah today where um, how God talks about the prayers are like incense mm -hmm. and he likes that smell and how um, when those prayers reach him that, you know, that's a sweet smell to him. So that imagery of that too, or, um, you know, like the white smoke is, yeah, he, I'm sure he'd much rather have that coming up, like you said, that are any dark thoughts <laughs> to him. When I went back and I read the Maggie story to myself a couple of times, but when I went back the second time, I had totally missed the piece about the fact that that, that it turned and went into her. Um, so that to me is a super strong visual of the power of prayer. Now, whether that prayer healed Maggie, who knows? But, but I think there's times when I'm praying for people on our prayer list or whatever. And I, you know, I wonder, am I, is this doing something? I mean, I certainly keep doing it, but, um, how, you know, we don't get to see a visual like that. That's a pretty amazing thing, a pretty amazing experience that she was um, able to be part of that and, and see it. Um, all right, was that good? I mean, was it as good as I thought it might be? To me, it was like absolutely life-changing and how I wanted to, to think and how I wanted to um, move forward. Um, that was early in my healing process. I mean, I, I discovered Maggie probably six years ago, that story. Um, and it it's it's a real quick changer for me when I'm getting into the um, and I'm whiny and pouty and well, because even Jesus said that um, you know that our thoughts are just as bad as the action. Like if you look lustfully at another woman, that's just like you know. In his eyes, you know, it's, it's, it's adultery. It's yeah. you know, so um, you know, he knows our thoughts too. It's not just the things we do. He can, you know, he knows all of us. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I agree on on all of that. Um, so whether it's whether you believe it really happened or not, how can you not take away the power of? thinking in a positive, you know, light way and catching yourself because of that story. Yeah, it's just it's a beautiful I think it's I it, to me it was. Mm -hmm. Um I mean I I do I personally believe it happened. Um but um so uh you can read my paragraph if you went to yourself, but I, the the Ending sentence, we have the choice to radiate the smoke of divine love or the black smoke of a sinful heart. That's kind of um, what I think the summary of the Maggie story is. And so the cost to us is um, it's, it's not just a cost to us, it's a cost to the world, it's a cost to the people around us. It is... Um, it, it, I mean, you can you can go to your workplace or you can go to a store, you can go wherever you are just in your family and you can sow discord. You have that right. You can do it. Um, or you can be somebody who uh, tries to have beautiful divine smoke wherever you go. 
And if everybody had beautiful divine smoke wherever they went, we would be living on heaven on earth. Minus the story, the statement is just another thing that we can use to help us move in, in white way rather than dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then this is just the same I've already said in a different way, but bear in mind, cost of living in a state of being offended seems minimal when compared to the other sins, but sin is sin. And this one is just as deadly, maybe more so because it seems insignificant and it's not as easily recognized. It's kind of that thief that comes in the night, a web that we get ourselves caught into and we don't, we don't even know what that they're there. Um, I kind of always skip over the physical stuff. I did that in, in uh, week two, I think, too. There is a, there's a physical toll on our body when we do these things. Um, I, I learned about our parasymp parasympathetic nervous system and, um, our, uh, sympathetic nervous system one is the state god created us to live in all the time and that's the parasympathetic one it's the one that allows us to sleep and sleep deeply it's the one that allows us to be calm it's the one that fills our body with good chemicals it's the one that keeps our blood pressure at a, at a good um whatever number our heart rate at a good um rate it 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 affects digestion, it affects everything. Um, the sympathetic one is the one, the fight and flight, where you need different chemicals, you need to get out of a situation. But when you are um, living in a constant state of offendedness, you can actually lock off your parasympathetic and totally be living in that sympathetic and that's when you start to get ill because you're flooding your body with bad chemicals. You aren't sleeping as well as you should be. Your heart rate is affected. Digestion is affected and your body just is not um, functioning well. And so we weaken our own physical bodies when, when we live this way. Um, apparently when I was I think it was more the second time I was hit. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not putting my wounds out here like I'm proud. I'm just telling you how I got where I was and where I am now. And can I just ask, like, what happened to you? I don't know your story. Oh, I got a concussion in the kitchen here at church. Oh, that's why I say God's funny. Okay, it's really funny. That was the first time. Or the that was the first one. Okay. Yeah, and it was, it was a bad. I didn't think it was a bad concussion. Um, because I, I mean, I had a little bump here, but what it was, it was a brain thrust into my brain stem. My whole brain went down, and it. It just really messed my room. It was, it was bad. Um, it was a full year kind of a brain rust, um, although I didn't get in very easily. And then the second time I was where I was uh, that's when I was going back to school. I was so dang determined I was going to get back to school. That's what he was really planning. Because um, I just made the decision that I would start back to school in January and I got rear ended uh, the day I said that. Um, because it wasn't, it, it wasn't the plan, it wasn't where I was supposed to be anymore. I just wasn't gonna, I didn't give in easily. But I got stuck in that bad nervous system. Um, but yeah. uh, let me interrupt you. That has nothing to do with being offended. No, okay. it doesn't, but it does, it does the, the, the uh, nervous system thing. That's the point I made. Apparently because I was, uh, this was so, I don't know, so, and I, um, I need, I didn't recognize it. Anyway, I, I just put it in there because it's a terrible way to live. And if you, um, if you ever find yourself feeling like you're just so locked and you can't get unlocked, you might be locked in that bad nervous system. That's why it's in there. So I'm a, a chronic pain physician assistant, and I see this all the time. Um, there's a huge amount of 
of what we're talking about living in this dependent stage. You can have physical um, physical impacts like you did that reset that that side of your nervous system. Um, but there is a huge emotional and living in this offended state that contributes. And it's a huge part of a lot of my chronic pain patients. And these patients that often are not responding to the, the Western medicine and, and treatments or their imaging is not showing us anything that correlates with their symptoms and things like that. It is because their, their nervous system is in this state. And it's hard to get patients to buy into that. But when it's hard to get yourself, um, it, it, it's, it's re it requires a big change. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about more of the emotional state and the, the state of your mind? It absolutely does. And so it feeds into to chronic pain and it leads to central sensitization of the pain where the pain is living in pathways in your body that you're essentially overstimulating and developing. And you can, it, it, on a physical aspect, there's a condition called complex regional pain syndrome. That's like a, a physical side where we actually see changes in um, the sympathetic nervous system. Usually that's after a major injury or surgery or something. And the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for swelling and color changes and things like that. So we actually see those physical changes that come along with it in the treatment when the treatment is actually, we do a nerve block of the sympathetic chain um, and can get measurable outcomes of that. But the, the emotional toll that we don't see puts these patients into these chronic pain states as well. And you see it in their, in their behavior and uh, their physicality and things like that. And, and it's hard to treat those when choosing to live in that attended state. Yeah. And I, I have, for me personally, um, it was when I finally surrendered, um, totally surrendered to it, kind of like Helen. I mean, I wasn't as smart as Helen or as brave as Helen, and I didn't have the, the awful trauma of what Helen did, but I just completely surrendered and said, All right, I, you know, what do you need of me? What? Why am I in this green pasture? What what am I supposed to be doing here? Um, and I I that's when my physical body began began to heal. I mean, it wasn't fast. Nothing. It wasn't overnight or anything. Nor was my spiritual growth. I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a learning curve. And the more that you are open to it, the more. Um, the more God can feed you, the more um, the um, you got to put time into it. You have to um, make it a priority. Well, I had two videos I wanted to share with you this evening, um, and I just threw Paul Harvey's link in there for anybody who hasn't listened to "A Vibe with the Devil." the The gentleman that we're going to listen to is a um, a preacher. And um, he's a, kind of a long-winded preacher. And so um, there was like 40 minutes of a video and I cut out um, I cut out a lot of it. But basically, he's telling his story about a time that another minister who was his mentor wounded him. And he was too proud to do anything about it. He kept saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, until his wife said, you are not fine. And um, he began to uh, think he was um, becoming less offended. And it, it was a process for him. And toward then at the end, he, he kind of now was a warrior for living unoffendedly because he saw the cost to his life. He saw the cost to his um, congregation because he wasn't being the pastor that he could have been to his family and to that other person. Um, and so kind of like Helen, in, I guess it's a Helen-like thing, he went to that person and asked for forgiveness even though he wasn't the one who wounded him. Um, so let's see if I can bring it up. And um, let 
Maybe by the sixth class, I'll be, no, I don't want to do that. I just need to get, I need to get to the desktop. Sorry, guys. I'm not good at this. Click on that blonde. Thank you, Herb. <laughs> Somehow I need to get to my desktop without shutting this down. Nope. I did it before. Terry, you helped. Terry. Watching online, you helped. Yeah. So what are you trying to get to? I want to get to my desktop because that's where the video is. But every time I do something like this, I try to shut it down. You have that on. That, that's not the one I want, but maybe if we go there. I mean, I I was going to show this too, but we don't have time. So is this? No, I mean, need to get to it's over here on my desktop. Okay. Oh, we're getting close. Okay. We're getting close. Now let's shut all this off. Okay. And actually, this is a touch screen. Oh, so we just want to. Well, there you go. Yeah. Oops. Too many it's people like, touch. Okay. Too many cooks. There. Um. No. So this would probably that one up in the corner would have probably been the. It's over there. There it is. There you go. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for your patience. I don't know how to oh come on. Jim did this for us. One of the signs that Jesus points out that I want to really zero in on tonight is found in verse 10. I don't like his preaching style. In Matthew 24. So let's look at but this. But I'm not offended Jesus by said, and then many. Everybody say many. All right. The Greek word there, many, literally means majority. I want you to think this through, okay, as we read this. And then many will be offended. Everybody say offended will betray one another and will hate oh. one another. Now, this is a progression. Okay, I should set up that this is from um, the book of Matthew when the disciples say to Jesus, "What what's going to happen when you're gone and what will it be like? And so this is, this is kind of like in the end of time. Um, this is what society will be this corrupt an offended person will eventually betray and if a betrayal is not dealt with it will ultimately lead to hatred you say john where do you get that from proverbs chapter 18 verse 19 says this a brother or sister offended is harder to win than a strong city now in the days of solomon who wrote the book of Proverbs, what did strong cities have around them? Walls. What were the walls built for? Protection. Those walls would keep out those people that you believe were against you and allow in those people that you believed were for you. Well, this is exactly what an offended person does. They begin to build walls. Now, they're not physical walls. They're actually walls that are developed in our soul. The New Testament doesn't call them walls. The New Testament calls them strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. How many of you know we are in a battleground, not a playground? He goes on to say, For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly or carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what are those strongholds? He goes on to list them. Casting down every imagination. Now, a better rendition of that would be reasoning. Casting down every reasoning. Every, every point your finger to your head and say reasoning. Please don't. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Point to your finger to your head and say knowledge. And bringing every thought. Say thought. And bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So what are these strongholds or walls? They are thought processes or reasonings that we develop deep within our soul that are contrary to the word of God. Now, how many of you know God's nature? 
is to love. Matter of fact, he doesn't have love. He is love. He's the very essence of it. And the love of God always seeks to give, to give, to give. Somebody who has been hurt now says, I don't want to get hurt again. So they begin to build deep reasonings, protection mechanisms in their thoughts that protect them. So their focus shifts from give, give, give to protect, protect, protect. Now that makes us a perfect candidate for betrayal. Now, a lot of Christians do not understand what betrayal is. When they hear the word betrayal, they go to the extreme case. Benedict Arnold, Judas. A betrayal is simply this. When I seek my benefit or my protection at the expense of when I have a relationship with. So if I'm offended, I am hurt, and now my thoughts are protect, if push comes to shove, I will protect myself even at the expense of somebody I have a relationship with. A betrayal is an ultimate abandonment of a relationship. And if it is not dealt with, it will ultimately lead into hatred. Now, a lot of people don't understand hatred. They associate hatred with anger, harsh feelings. No, there can be no anger at all. The Bible says that Absalom hated Ammon, therefore he neither spoke good nor evil to him. The word hate in the Greek literally means this, loveless. It is a vacuum void of any kind of love. So there can be no emotions attached to it. So what Jesus is saying in these last days is that the majority are going to be offended. The offenses are going to lead to betrayals, and the betrayals are going to lead to hatred. And then he says in verse 11, he said, and then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Everybody say many. Who are the many that these false prophets are going to deceive? The many that are offended. Now that tells me something right there. That Jesus is showing us that an offended heart is the breeding ground of deception. Now there's only one problem with deception. And that is this, it's deceiving. The person who is deceived believes with all their heart they're right, but in reality they're wrong. That's scary. Now Jesus calls these false prophets wolves in sheep's clothing. Notice he does not call them wolves in shepherd's clothing. Everybody is always looking for the false prophet behind the pulpit. In 40 years of ministry, I found there are more wolves in the seats than there are in the pulpits. And wolves do something. They travel in packs. And they have a goal. And that is to isolate the sheep from the herd. If they can isolate the sheep from the herd, the sheep is meat for their table. Well, Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, A brother who seeks his own desire rages against all wise judgment. Or, excuse me, let me say it again. Proverbs 18, 1 says, A brother who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise judgment. So in other words, you can be a part of a big family, a big church, but the isolation occurs right here in the soul. Are you getting this? And then he goes on to say in verse 10, and he says, because lawlessness, now this is all a progression, because lawlessness will abound. Now, what does the word lawless mean? Lawless is the Greek word anomia, which simply means this. You're a law unto yourself. In other words, you are not fully submitted to the authority of God's word. Boy, it's quiet in this Presbyterian church right now. <laughs> when you enter into an offense and you seek to protect and you begin to develop these thoughts that are contrary to the word of God, you have now entered into lawless thinking. And because lawlessness will abound, the love, now look at this, the love of many will grow cold. Now, how many of you believe lawlessness abounds in our society? Let me see your show of hands. Without a doubt. However, this is what's really scary. Jesus isn't talking about society. He's talking about the church. Again, an offended believer is someone who had never even realized or have, has forgotten what they have been forgiven. Well, we need to realize 
is that when Adam sinned against God, God the Father could have looked at God the Son and said, you know what? They chose the devil over us. They committed high treason against us. Let them all go to hell and burn with the devil forever. Let's go over and create another universe and create somebody who really loves us. And he would have been perfectly just because you know what our just reward was? Every single one of us was to burn in a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. That's what we deserve. You know, what, you know what the big problem is? We've categorized sins in the church. We have, we have the big ones, adultery, murder, witchcraft, uh, uh, stealing. Then we have what we call weaknesses, strife, unforgiveness, gossip, gossip. You know what Proverbs 6 says? These six things the Lord hates and the seventh is an abomination. Do you know adultery is not in that list? I am not justifying adultery. The Bible says you practice it, you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not talking. But, but you know what I find interesting? You know what the seventh one on that list is that God says is an abomination? Those who sow discord among brothers. Gossip. This is what I want to say. Treat gossip the way you treat adultery, you'll probably get free. But if you see it as a weakness, it's getting quieter in here. Treat unforgiveness the way you treat murder, and you'll probably be free. You know what's amazing? I can show you three times more scriptures in the Gospels of Jesus saying the person that refuses to forgive will not inherit the kingdom of God than I can a murder. Three times. You pray every day in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us for our trespasses, the way we've forgiven those who have trespassed against us. Do you want God to forgive you the way you've forgiven those people that have hurt you? Well, the truth is, that's the way you will be forgiven. Because God has placed his love in our heart, and we have the ability to forgive just like Jesus did when he hung on the cross and said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Isn't that good news? I'm preaching myself happy right now, Pastor Rob. I'm so excited right now. The Holy Spirit said, read, read Psalm 35. So go to Psalm 35. I have no idea what you're reading now. Okay. Yeah. I guess we can put back on what's going on here. 11 verses. Watch this. This is his. <laughs> this is him trying to forgive this man that's really um, hurt him. And so he thinks he's done. And, and he has a whole tie in. I didn't pick it because he had a whole tie in. He had a bad knee injury and he wasn't healing and he wasn't healing and he wasn't healing. Um, and um, anyway, long story short, he healed he healed this long three-year um, offense that he held in his heart, even though he wasn't acting like he was offended. And his, his physical body came along with it. But anyway, he's he's showing how he started his baby steps to for forgiveness. That's what's going on here. I did him good. He paid me back evil. He said, and David said, I sink in despair. Now look at this. Look at, keep going. But when they were sick, dressed in the morning, I deprived myself of food, I prayed, I had bowed low, who was my friend or my beloved. Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, You pray for that man that you want me to do in your life when you pray. I got up from the table that day. And everything I wanted from God, I started praying for him. But Lord, I pray that he would know you the best a man can know you. I pray that he would please you the best a man can please you. I pray that he would walk as closely with you as a man can walk with you. I pray, Lord God, that you would bless his family, that you protect his family, that Lord, you'd surround him with wise counsel, that you would bring him finances for his ministry from unexpected quarters. Everything, everything. I wanted us to start praying for him. Can I tell you something? It was so painful. You ever hear somebody say, pray when it feels good? Oh, that's ridiculous. Pray truth. Okay. Pray I mean, truth. I'm sorry. I, I... Okay. Let me tell you something. Anybody ever gone through physical therapy? I did with my shoulder. Look, I don't hit girls, but I wanted to hit my physical. <laughs> um, it's seven. So you've got a link to the whole thing if you want to watch him. Um, basically, the ending is, I mean, he's very blunt in saying you will burn in a lake of fire if you carry unforgiveness in your heart, if you carry wounds in your heart. Um, I mean, it's, 
There's no doubt in what he's preaching there. Um, okay, um, any last thoughts before we say goodbye for the evening? Actually, I can't get to this week. It takes me to somewhere where I'm supposed to sign in. On the church website? And I click your link. Um, oh, you mean that I have embedded here? Mm -hmm. For the, for him? No, for the, your whole, whole evening to view my file with this link. All right, I'll, I'll talk to Drew. He, he's the link guy. Um, can you uh, email us or whatever uh, this? Just yeah, you you have it in your pocket. That's what, and I emailed that out to you. I guess today I didn't get it out um, quite as early as I did. It's the um, the other one is really good too. It's a it's a lady and her husband who who started like three different church ministries and the conflict that took place and so many of them and how she has learned to develop an undefendable heart because. Um, you can't do God's work if you choose to live offended. And she wanted her life to be used in that purpose, but it wasn't easy. Um, it, I mean, it's it's a good listen to as well. And if it doesn't, if you can't just click on my link and copy it and put that it link in. link is in here. It's yeah. on, it's 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 on the last page. page. It's, it's three on green. The three green things are links. Oh, um, the top one we didn't watch. The the second one we did watch, and the third one is the um, Paul Harvey, the Five of the Devil. I just listened to it again today. It is so prophetic. I listened to it after we were went to the Presbyterian meeting. Got um, listened to it. I never heard it before, but it is. I mean, it's just amazing. So, all right, I'm going to do a quick closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity in this country that we have the freedom to gather and to worship and to talk with each other and to praise you and to learn. We ask blessings on all our brothers and sisters who are in countries where that is not their story. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.